If you have half a Bitcoin, you're gonna have more money than you can imagine. The average poor person in 2060 is gonna be way richer than the average poor person in 2025. Most people would never have a million sats. Look at the people before you, look at the people after you. It's not even a question. There's 300 to 500 times more people after you than before you. And all of a sudden you realize you're not too late. You're actually very early and you have way more in common with Michael Saylor than you have in common with the average person. 80% of the people watching the show could go to an airport and fly to any country in the world. In ancient Rome, 2000 years ago, 99% of the world was poor. 500 years ago, 96% of the world was poor. 200 years ago, 92% of the world was poor. And then 100 years ago, like 85% of the world was poor. And now 15% of the world is extremely poor, making less than $2 a day. Power in Bitcoin is different than power in the fiat system. Power in the fiat system is who has most political currency. Power in Bitcoin is who has the most ideas. We have currently the situation where a lot of wealth is in uh, not a lot of hands of people, like globally, not in Bitcoin. Uh, and most people are struggling. Do you think, uh, or how do you think will Bitcoin change that, that uh, most people are um, rich or like most people are wealthy and only a, a handful of people are struggling? That would be the, the major outcome. Or maybe even like nobody struggles, but I don't know if this is even reachable. Um That's something I think a good bit about because I think it's interesting and I think it's important. Um, I think it just comes down to what is one's priority, right? If, if is one's priority to have equality or is one's priority to have the most wealth for the most number of people possible, right? Um, you know, if e even our own personal lives, I think this is a big guiding question, right? If, if my goal is to be the richest person, that is a different goal than wanting to get richer, right? Um, you know, it, it might seem like a subtle goal or a irre relevant difference, but I think it's pretty important because fear is a zero sum game, right? Um, and everyone getting wealthy is not a zero sum game. So, you know, let's take Michael Saylor as, you know, the famous, infamous, whatever example um, of this in Bitcoin. Um, you know, Michael Saylor is one of the, whatever, five biggest holders of Bitcoin. MicroStrategy is definitely one of the five biggest, you know, institutions in Bitcoin. But even Michael Saylor personally is going to be one of the richest people in all of Bitcoin, uh, you know, besides Satoshi and maybe a handful of OGs, um, you know. And so there's only so many spots at the top, right? Like there's only 10 spots in the top 10, right? And there's only one spot for the richest person in the world or the richest person in Bitcoin. And so if someone's trying to become richer, like you're inherently playing a zero sum game. Like you can only have the ranking of order once, um, but everyone getting richer in Bitcoin is a different goal. I think it's a better goal. I think it's a goal that is one we tend to forget. It's one that doesn't pray or, or doesn't take advantage of our human emotions, right? I think we're wired to prefer the former more than the latter. I think we're wired to measure our own success, not actually on how well we're doing, But on how well relative to everyone else, right? Like you and I are having this conversation, we're in two different countries on two different continents and two different time zones, um, you know, at two different times of day. And we're having this conversation real time via computers and the internet and everyone's watching this um, in their own place in the world at their own preferred time. And they're watching it any time in the future. Maybe they're watching this conversation a week in the future or, or a year in the future or 20 years in the future. And so in absolute terms, we're very rich, but a lot of people today don't feel rich. A lot of people more than ever, I think, feel quote unquote behind. A lot of people feel behind. A lot of people feel relatively poor. A lot of people feel like life is getting worse. And I think there's a very real legitimate reason for them to feel that because their savings is getting worse. It is getting depleted. But at the same time, you know, I, I think it's just a funny reality of human nature that people... The, the people would be happier, I think, having less wealth, but being higher in the ranking than lower in the ranking and having more wealth. I've just seen that universally, universally right? Just this year, you know, I've been around some wealthy people, but you know, even before Bitcoin, I'd met some wealthy people. A lot of them seem pretty happy. A lot of them don't seem very happy. Uh, you know, I've, I've done various mission trips and, and um, you know, travel in my life, some places to very, very poor places. And you see the same thing there, right? When it comes to, you know, an impoverished village or, or town or, 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 you know, whatever, um, you know, the people that have bricks 
are are the subject of envy from people that you know don't have bricks right the person with um you know one kind of dirt and their house floor is preferred over somebody else right you know like it doesn't matter if we're talking about people with you know a thousand dollars of wealth to the name or a billion dollars of wealth to the name i think you know the whole ranking game is what is the primary driver of people continuing to get wealthy and so i guess my my hope in saying this is also to help hopefully remind all of us including myself that you know at a certain you know how do we measure success do we measure it based on comparing someone else or do we measure it based on um what our own personal goal is and so all that to say i suppose is that i think this question of wealth inequality and how does bitcoin change that i think we have to have with that context of what's the actual goal and so with that said i don't actually think wealth inequality inherently is a bad thing i don't actually think it's a bad thing i think it all comes down to how is wealth inequality created right is wealth inequality created as a function of everybody using a given political currency and then i have my foot on the lever of that political currency benefiting myself at the expense of others that is wrong that is evil that is stealing uh that is inherently a zero-sum game and inherently wealth has to centralize right this is what we see with bitcoin that or not with bitcoin but this is what we see with the the political currency reality of today is money is centralizing because political power has to centralize because political currency is centralizing and therefore you have to centralize information you have to centralize everything else in the world you have to centralize medicine you have to centralize food everything else in the world trends to centralization when the money itself is centralized and everyone's incentivized to do this the politicians are incentivized to do this because they they can't rein in control of the loose ends of the currency if they can't control the information because money is information and if you had a free market in non-monetary information that would inherently be a, a pressure on a monopoly of a political currency that is not a free market which is not and so you know i think that's what we see right now when it comes to wealth inequality and and centralization is it's more of a cannibalistic wealth inequality you know and you know i, I don't know robin how many of your listeners are americans or not um but this is probably important historical side note um both for the americans and the non-americans but in the great depression you know, my grandmother was born in 1932. She's still alive. And she was born in the Great Depression. So this is something that, you know, some people alive still have a touch point to this. But the Great Depression, what was one of the reasons why it accelerated so much, one of the reasons why was because of wealth inequality. One of the reasons why was because, uh, but really, it wasn't because of wealth inequality. It was because wealth inequality is a result of that cannibalistic force, right? Um, you know, there's all kinds of monetary problems, everything, of course. But after, um, after, you know, the great crash in 1929, what the American government did and a lot of their wisdom, quote unquote, was said, we need to raise prices, right? Prices are falling. This is deflation. Deflation is bad, blah, blah, blah. We need to force prices up, right? You know, we need to force the price of food, housing, everything up, right? Because so much money just disappeared from the banking system, right? If you ask any person that's older that remembers the Great Depression or their they remember as a child hearing stories of the Great Depression, you'll hear the same story over and over again. And that was that one day, just none of the banks had money, right? And that's because just all the credit wiped up went from many, many, many banks to a centralized number of banks, right? Again, centralization. But what we did was we, we artificially um, accelerated farming production and destruction, made farming much less efficient. Um, and we just slaughtered a bunch of livestock. Like we just went out and said, okay, we need to force prices up to save the economy. And so let's go out, kill a bunch of cows, kill a bunch of pigs, kill a bunch of animals, and that will force food prices up. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, and let's make farming a little bit more efficient. Let's, let's you know, bankrupt a lot of farmers, uh, you know, and that way we'll re-force up, you know, farmland prices and food prices. And of course, what did that happen? They had knockoff effects down the line. And then, you know, pretty soon, you know, they get what they wanted. Food prices went up, housing, you know, prices start people just couldn't afford it anymore right you know even if they didn't go up in nominal terms they went up in real terms compared to the wages people had and so anyway i suppose that's my point with wealth inequality is that when wealth inequality is the result of somebody leveraging current global energy for themselves at the expense of someone else that's inherently zero sum that's inherently taking money from somebody else but if we compare this to the other example, which is people actually producing stuff that I don't think is a zero sum game, right? Like, you know, let's take the show, Robin, right? You've put in a lot of work. You've done many, many shows. You've been doing a daily show. It's very impressive. 
in Bitcoin. I, there's very few people in Bitcoin that are doing one more than one show a week. I, I'm doing more than one show a week. I, I'm running three, soon to be four different Bitcoin podcasts. Um, but you know, you, you're, you've got this one show, and in this one show, you are doing a daily show, and it's very impressive. They're well edited, right? You're putting in a lot of value into the marketplace. People are watching it. They're clearly subscribing, which everyone should do. You should like, comment, subscribe to Robin's channel here. Um, but you are providing value to the marketplace. And as a result, you are going to get a disproportionate amount of return compared to the rest of, of the world, the rest of Bitcoin, right? You deserve more views on your Bitcoin podcast than 99.999% of the world's Bitcoin podcast because they don't have Bitcoin podcasts, right? You deserve the, the any money the show makes you. If it, if, it, if it makes you money, you deserve any money from it, um, you know, and you deserve the recognition from it, right? You know, the, um, musicians don't produce music at the same quantity or the same quality as each other. Uh, Bitcoin podcasters don't produce the same quality or, or quantity as each other. Um, not all CEOs that are stacking Bitcoin buy Bitcoin at the same rate, right? Like Michael Saylor. And so the ones that produce more for the free market deserve more of the returns of their labors, right? But that, you know, works voluntarily. You are contributing your work voluntarily. People consume it voluntarily. And so I don't think that inequality, whether it's wealth inequality, whether it's talent inequality, whether it's experience inequality, uh, whether it's reputation inequality, you know, however you want to define it. For some reason, people just arbitrarily say, oh, wealth and equality is bad, right? Oh, we understand some people have better athletic ability than others. Some people have better, you know, education that, you know, all these other things are fine, but wealth is bad. Wealth and equality is bad. And, um, you know, anyway, I think a lot of that is just a misidentifying of, of non-zero sum game wealth and equality with cannibalistic zero sum game wealth and equality. I think the people that don't understand how money corrupts society and society then feeds back and corrupts the money. I think people that don't understand that then collude the two and they say, oh, the free market is wealth and equality and that is bad and cannibalistic. When the reality is that in an actual free market where wealth and equality can flourish um, naturally or as a symptom and a result of the free market uh, grows, um, you know, I, I think that's what we'll see. And so with Bitcoin, I think we're actually going to see wealth and equality increase, not decrease, because in every poor country, there's a lot less wealth inequality. In every rich country, there's a lot more wealth inequality. But the average poor person in a rich country is way richer than the average poor person in other country, right? So I'm in the United States, right? In the United States, wealth inequality is a very talked about problem. You know, the top 1% of, of wealth or, or the top 1% of rich people um, in this, uh, the top 1% of people in this country, you know, own whatever, 45, 50% of the wealth, you know, whatever it is, right? Pick a number, right? Um, it, it's very concentrated at the top. I think a big part of that is obviously from fiat shenanigans, like don't get me wrong, you know, and you can clearly see the tie with that compared to 1944, 1971, wealth inequality skyrockets after 1971. But, you know, I, I think the other side of that question though, is what is the average poor person in America, right? I forget the poverty line cutoff here in America, but it's something like 16, $18,000 a year, something like that. I think, uh, maybe it's 12, but even if it is 12,000. You know, that is way more money than what the average person in Kenya makes in a year. That's way more money than what the average person in, uh, you know, in a lot of Latin America makes, surely, right? Like the average, quote unquote, poor person here in America is poor on a relative basis in America on a ranking scale, but they're probably still within the top 15%, maybe 20% of global income earners, right? And so, you know, I think if we want to think of Bitcoin as a political movement, because I think of Bitcoin as a political movement, it's a political money. It's not a political currency, but having people voluntarily join a network that abides by rules and the rules don't have politicians, like it's still kind of political, right? I think we could think of Bitcoin like a this first decentralized nation. And if Bitcoin is that, if Bitcoin is the metaphorical America, and right now we are the metaphorical developing country, you know, I think I, I don't think it makes any sense. Uh, you know, I, I've heard some Bitcoiners say this and I respect them, but I, I, I just don't think it makes a lot of sense to say, oh, wealth inequality is going to go down on a Bitcoin standard. No, I think it's going to go up because everybody is going to have the opportunity to contribute in a free market, right? Most people don't have the opportunity to contribute to a free market right now. Just most people don't. And so what happens when more people enter the free market and we don't have a monopoly on monetary policy? I think 
as a function of free market going up, we are going to have inevitably more and more people having natural wealth inequality, right? But the thing is that if you are thinking from the ranking perspective, you think, oh, that's pessimistic. You know, all the OG rich Bitcoiners are just going to watch it go to the moon and all everyone else is going to be poor and servants or whatever. But I, I think, you know, the correct way to look at it, the non-zero sum way to look at it is to say, you know, the average poor person in 2060, hopefully is going to be way richer than the average poor person in 2025, right? Um, you know, and I think and hope that's what we're going to see. Um, but I think we're just going to see more and more of that. So I, I know I've been talking well, but I guess to wrap that up, like what does it actually mean in numbers? I think what that means in numbers that people need to wrap their head around is just orders of magnitude, right? Um, going from 10,000 Bitcoin all the way down to 10,000 sats, right? From 10,000 sats, you have 100,000 sats, a million sats, 10 million sats, 100 million sats, uh, a billion sats, 10 billion, 100 billion, you know, you just go all the way up to 10,000 Bitcoin, which is trillion sats, I believe. So if you're a sat trillionaire, you've got 10,000 Bitcoin. If you're a sat billionaire, you've got 10 Bitcoin. If you're a sat millionaire, you've got 1 million sats, right? Or 1% of the Bitcoin. And the funny thing is, most people would never have a million sats, right? A lot of people watching this show probably have heard that. Maybe they believe it, maybe they don't. But if you believe any significant percentage of the world's adults are going to use Bitcoin, it's just inherent. Most of them will never have a million sats. And so if you are a sat billionaire, 10 Bitcoin, right? Some people watching this maybe only have three Bitcoin. So they're 30% of the way to being a sat billionaire. Um, other people watching this maybe have 30 coins. And so they're, you know, 300% or whatever. They're way over being a sat billionaire. But, you know, I, I think how close they are to 10 Bitcoin is irrelevant. I think the point stands that there's way more people going to be at the sat millionaire level or below than people above you, right? And so a lot of people think they're too late to Bitcoin and, oh, all the OGs that bought in 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, they all got so lucky. I'm too late. I only have three Bitcoin. I only have 21 Bitcoin. I only have, you know, two thirds of a Bitcoin, you know, whatever, you know, again, it's all in here. It's all in their mind, right? It's like, it's all ranking, right? They, they perceive themselves to not be early to Bitcoin because they are viewing their relative quote unquote status within Bitcoin as a function of how many Bitcoin they have. And because everyone else in Bitcoin right now has more coins in them, they think they're too late. But what they're forgetting to keep in mind is that they're not thinking in absolute terms. And if everybody's going to have Bitcoin, look at the people before you, look at the people after you. It's not even a question. There's 300 to 500 times more people after you than before you. And all of a sudden you realize you're not too late. You're actually very early and you are, you have way more in common with Michael Saylor than you have in common with the average person. Because there's going to be way fewer people between you and Michael Saylor, you, the sat billionaire, and him, the sat trillionaire, than you, the sat billionaire, and the average person that will not even be a sat millionaire, right? And, you know, anyway, I guess all I have to say is that, you know, I think wealth inequality is um, greatly misunderstood. I think there's good, I think there's wealth inequality is a symptom of of a good free market. I think there's wealth inequality as a symptom of an evil cannibalistic society. I think uh, wealth inequality is not going to go down on a Bitcoin standard. I think it's only going to go up. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's only going to go up and hopefully um, it's it's going up as a result of the free market and of more and more people having um, wealth, right? I actually think that, you know, if we could time travel and just see in the future that there was less wealth inequality in the future, um, you know, I think if there was less wealth inequality in the future, I think that's um, going to be a bad thing. Um, whereas if there was a lot of wealth inequality, it could be a bad thing because maybe it's because the world is completely centralized on a fiat standard. But I think more likely is that Bitcoin has just taken over everything and the free market has been spread to everybody instead of just, you know, the 15, 20 percent of rich Americans. Um, you know, and that's the funny thing about us Americans. We're typically the most loud about wealth inequality. Why? Because we're basically the richest nation. <laughs> And, you know, as the nation gets richer, they care more and more about that. So, you know, it's it's a bit of our own privilege, I think, that people making 30 grand a year, which are in the top 5% of income earners, are complaining about the top 1%. It's like, you know, you're, you're complaining about the 4% of people ahead of you while forgetting that to the other 95% of the world, you know, you're the rich person to them, right? So anyway.
That was uh, amazing. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot to unpack in there. Um, the one thing that I've thought about is um, when we have this ranking system, I love the way how you look at it. Uh, and we, uh, the one thing to look at it, the ranking system and the one thing to look at like, oh, how good I'm actually uh, on a personal level, like just like blending out all the other people and like just focusing on myself, like, okay, like I can eat every day, I have a shelter, uh, I can I drive around with a car every day. I can go across borders. Like I'm basically pretty rich uh, and not comparing yourself to a Michael Saylor who has a yacht and a private jet and all those things. Like that that seems ridiculous. And also one, one thing I thought about is um, a really quick uh, personal story. Uh, I'm a professional swimmer, not any longer, but I was. And I was in a small, small town and the pool there went completely broke so we had to go to the big city and uh and then i was in a way bigger club and my times in the pool like the how fast i was swimming skyrocketed within one year because in the small town i was the big fish i was the i'm two meters long i, I like just because of my body i was pretty fast but there were people that were like half my size and were faster than me because they trained harder they were already better uh, and just me putting myself in a pawn uh, literally in a pool where there are so many faster fish than me this motivated me and kept uh, made my own standard so much higher and there is something really good about this competitiveness and what you're also ta talking about this ranking system where you look um, at your surroundings and you maybe uh, try to, to score higher than, than other people. So like that's a, the free market working. And that, I think that's a good thing, as, as you also said it. The one thing that is probably because people think that uh, wealth and quality is bad is because uh, of the unfair nature, as you said, like it's, it comes from a bad intent. It comes from a bad place where, why we have this uh, in, inequality. And maybe that's, connected to like because the the where the poorest line is and how many are under this this poorest line and i guess my my question is a little bit is like will that that poverty line uh if there is something like that um the poverty line comes so wide down that actually like even the last person <laughs> in that ranking system is pretty good like he can live a pretty good life and a pretty normal life uh, at some point because Bitcoin kind of does this um, book. I, I, I was making a podcast with uh, Eon Abelberg, and he talks about uh, abundance through scarcity. It's like, could, could we get to a point where we have so much wealth in overall in the world, but the last person in this rank is, 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 is pretty rich to compare to right now? Uh, but there are still a lot of inequality above that, which would not be bad. It's just a competitive free market, which I like a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if that will happen. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. Um, I, I agree with your point, um, you know, that it's all about comparison, right? I mean, like you, myself, and probably at least 80% of the people watching the show, if not all of them, you know, could... Literally today, if they really wanted to go to an airport and fly to any country in the world that is safe, right? It's like for 500 bucks or a thousand bucks, which probably most people watching this have in their bank account or in their Bitcoin wallet or whatever, um, you know, they could like, that's, <laughs> that's just so indescribable. It's like no, no king or emperor of, of the world up until, you know, a century ago could do that. Uh, you know, no, like we just take for granted that the optionality we don't necessarily execute on, but that's still there. It's just what the richest people in the world a hundred years ago couldn't have done. Right. And, you know, when I talk about, you know, I've said this before in a couple other videos about how we've, the average Bitcoiner today is more in common with Michael Saylor than the average Bitcoin holder of 20, 30, 40 years from now. But I think that's true. Right. Cause Michael Saylor, like you mentioned, he, he has his yachts, he has his planes, he, you know, he's got a jet or multiple jets i'm sure i mean you know like he has all of that and can go anywhere in the world whenever he wants um you know and like okay maybe i can't do that maybe you can't do that maybe most people watching this can't do that but we can do 80 percent of that right like maybe we can't go to every nice restaurant in the world or every big fancy city in the world whenever we want but we could probably go to at least half of them or at least 80 percent of them right but for most of the world they can't 
do any, right? Like, I forget what the actual number is. Um, I, I encourage people to look it up, but I think the actual number of people, um, here, let me just look it up real quick. Uh, what percent of the world, I forget what the actual percentage of people in the world that have flown on a plane is, but it's a very, very low number. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. according to Boeing, um, uh, Boeing's research, um, 80% of the world has never taken a flight, at least. I'm actually surprised it's that low. I thought it was going to be higher. But, you know, it's like the majority of the world, the majority has never flown on a plane once. And I've been very fortunate. I've gone to these Bitcoin conferences. You know, I've gone to 13, 14 Bitcoin conferences this year. I mean, every single one of them has like three plane trips with, you know, two layovers to get to any one city, right? It's like we complain about layovers and that, oh, dang it. My, you know, my flight was canceled. I got to take an extra flight now to this other city. It's like, you know, we complain about an extra flight um, on one trip that maybe has, you know, four to six plane flights and most people never take a one. Right. And so, so anyway, I, I guess that's my point that, you know, again, on a relative basis, we can feel like we're nowhere close to a certain goal, a certain stacking target or a certain person with a lot more money than us. But on an absolute terms, it's like, it's just not even comparable. And so anyway, anyway, you got, I, I guess to get back to your question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I do think the average poor person today is doing a lot better than they were, you know, a couple hundred years ago or even a hundred years ago. You know, this is, this is my first Bitcoin thread uh, on, on Twitter. It was about how we've less in common with their new future in the ancient past. And one of the first charts in that thread, maybe even the first one in that thread was about human poverty. Um, it, it's, it's from, uh, our world of data. It's a great chart. I don't know if you want me to pull it up or not, but I, I guess I could, but I, I could describe it, you know, basically over the last few hundred years, you know, global poverty has been pretty flat and then it's just had a steep curve down. Right. Um, and this is part of the point of that thread. This is part of the point I keep trying to hammer home for Bitcoiners into their brains, because I think this is really important for everyone to internalize, not because I said it, but because it is true. And we need to remember this. We have less in common with the near future than the ancient past. Like Rome, in ancient Rome, you know, 2000 years ago, 99% of the world was poor, right? What we would call poor, right? Um, you know, 500 years ago, 96% of the world was poor. 200 years ago, you know, 92% of the world was poor or whatever, you know, and then 100 years ago, like 85% of the world was poor. And now, it's like 15% of the world is extremely poor, making less than $2 a day. And, you know, 70% of the world is making less than $30 a day, or it's roughly that. I don't know. Somebody in the comments will roast me for not having it memorized, but, but I think it's roughly that R roughly a little over two thirds of the world makes less than 30 bucks a day. And something like a fifth or a sixth of the world makes less than a dollar a day. It's something like that right now. And so at any point on that timeline, we've had less in common with the near future in the past, right? If we go back to Rome, if we were having this conversation in Rome, which by the way, we're having in person, um, you know, talking over our flock of goats or whatever, instead of podcasts with mics and, you know, internet stuff. Um, but we would have less in common with the future in the past, right? It's like, oh, wow, Rome is really exciting. Can you believe it? Like right now, 1% of the world's wealthy. We have less in common with the future in the past. In the next hundred years, the next century, the next couple of generations, we're going to go from 1% to 2% of the world not being poor. That's doubling. We are going to have more change in the next 100 years from 0 AD to 100 AD than all of human history thus far, wealth-wise, right? We have less in common with that future than the past, right? Then we skip forward, you know, a few hundred years. Now we're in the Middle Ages or Renaissance or whatever. Again, we have less in common with the future in the past, right? Oh, 4% of the world is wealthy now. And, and you know, 96% of the world is still, you know, very poor. You know, it, it doesn't, you know like dying of disease or childbirth, all those things are still very likely, you know, like no, ma no matter at what point you're at, like the near future has always been more dramatic, right? Going back a hundred years to early 20th century, you know, for the entirety of human history, over 90% of the world has been poor, you know, eight to 10% of the world's now wealthy, like a hundred years from now, the year 2025, all of a sudden we're going to go from the majority being poor to the majority not being and, and uh, not being on starvation level poor, but to lower, lower middle class poor. Like that's where we are right now. And so to your question and, and to your, the point Yoni makes, you know, like, yeah, I think it's hopeful and possible that in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 
we can look back and say, yep, that's exactly what happened. You know, 30 years ago in, in 2025, the majority of the world was making less than $30 a day, the majority of the world. And now the majority of the world is making more than the equivalent amount of $30 a day, right? We have gone from the majority of the world having to worry about childbirth, uh, you know, killing the mother, killing the child, to now the majority of the world doesn't have to worry about that. We've gone from the majority of the world worrying about diseases to them not having to worry about them, right? To the same extent. And so I think that we're going to have a greater share uh, horizontally of more people being wealthy and a greater amount of wealth vertically of wealth going up, right? Because the richest person 2000 years ago was poor compared to the richest person a thousand years ago, which was poor compared to the richest person a hundred years ago. And that person is poor compared to the richest person today. And all of the wealth of the richest people in the world, the richest dudes, right? Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Michael Saylor, right? All those guys, their maximum wealth today is going to be cheap in terms of wealth of the future, right? You know, let's take Elon Musk as the infamous example, right? You know, Elon Musk is the richest person in the world, the richest guy in the world, I guess, you know, if, if you want to only stick with the, you know, people we know that have a lot of money. Um, and, you know, he's spending like his whole life and like all of his money to get one person to Mars, right? Like that's his whole goal, right? Whether you agree with it or not, like that's what he's doing. He's trying to get a dude to Mars, right? But in 30 years, 50 years, assuming he's successful, like people are going to be able to go to Mars for, you know, like one year's salary, right? Like the richest person, like the richest guy in the world 50 years from now is going to be able to do way more than what Elon Musk can do today, right? And so not only do we hope a greater share of the world population is wealthy, but our whole definition of wealth changes vertically too as we get more wealth. So yeah, I do think it's possible that the average poor person in the future is way richer than the average person today. But number one, I don't know if we'll recognize it because that's already happened, right? Like this isn't a theoretical, I, like I think this has already happened. Like the average poor person today objectively is wealthier than the average poor person, you know, centuries ago, right? Because the average poor person today doesn't have to worry about cholera to the same degree, right? They don't have to worry about, you know, so much of, you know, the ancient world. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I appreciate the question, like will the average poor person in the future be, you know, wealthy, I think so, but will they be content? I don't know. Cause they will always be at the bottom of the ladder, you know? And, you know, I'm not saying that in a, you know, mocking or demeaning way. It's just like, that's the reality. Like the average poor person in the future, maybe they have more wealth than me, right? Like, I mean, at this time in history, we only have, you know, these little smartphones, like these are going away, right? Like these are going to be gone in 20, 30, 40 years. I don't know what replaces them. It's a little concerning to think about what replaces them, but it's like, the average poor person in the future, even if they're richer than me and you and everyone watching, it's like they still may not be happy or content because in the way, again, humans perceive success being relative, they may not be happy. And that's not just true of people at the bottom ladder. It's true of people near the top of the ladder, right? I mean, you know, is it better? Or are Americans necessarily happier than the rest of the world? I don't, I don't know. Because... People in poverty in other parts of the world, they work all day, you know, they have community, they need community to survive and, and, you know, get by and have a dream of a future, right? Maybe they, you know, buy a train ticket to a different country. Maybe they save up for a family business or whatever. But here in America, we're wealthy. We don't need that. We don't need to aspire to, you know, make it to the other side where the grass is greener. Uh, you know, we're wealthy and we have the fortune to be able to sit at home and scroll on these little things all day. And see videos of people that have the jets and the Lambos and the and the mansions. And so, you know, even though we're a lot richer, um, it's a ironic ironic uh, result of our own success is that as a result of our own success, we have time to enjoy our success. And in that time of our success, we we see others being more successful, and therefore, I mean, we feel worse. So, so anyway, like I think it's I think it's. Yeah, I think it's an economics question, but I think it's more so a human psychology question. I, I think the average poor person will be richer in productivity, but will they be richer in contentment or uh, life satisfaction? I think that's a different question. I don't know. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep 
the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Pro probably uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, I love the way how you think about it because um, like even if, we just look at like 100 years ago, uh, the average person now, like the average Joe on, on, on this world living, he can do so much more than the richest dude alive like 100 or 200 years ago. That's that, that's a fascinating mind shift uh, perspective to to do. That's, that's really powerful, honestly, really cool. Also like the, uh, I mean, you kind of answered my next question, so we'll we'll not go into deep to that. But I wanted to ask you, like, uh, if if that envy and that feeling, like, oh, like let's tax the rich, like <laughs> let's do that. But you kind of an answered it already. Where like, oh no, that that will probably not go away. And maybe even like be more there. I don't know. Um, but now to the next one. What do you think then actually Bitcoin? changes when when this like ranking system it makes it more fair because everyone is kind of paying into the same like let's assume that bitcoin is um a global world uh currency global world asset and then uh, when you produce something uh, you save it in bitcoin and therefore you we all benefit from you making the world more productive and and and, and more innovative um, when we have this world, what 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 truly uh, changes uh, in that ranking system compared to the, the the central banking system that we we have now? Central banking system, power is who has the most money, right? We, we, really, what we're attracted to is power. Like we're not actually attracted to the money; we're attracted to power, right? Female peacocks are attracted to peacocks with a lot of feathers, right? Lionesses are attracted to the lion with mane. Um, people are attracted to power, right? Um, you know stereotype stereotypical roles here but you know men typically are attracted to women that have the power or the ability let's say to produce children right and so women that are perceived as beautiful are you know the the, the desire of men and likewise women are attracted to men that have a certain degree of power right whether that's physically being big muscles which i certainly don't have uh, or money status whatever and I, I, I say that to say, like, I think I think that's what we're actually attracted to. And so I think what creates power in the two different systems is the way to look at that. Right. So in central banking and fiat, what brings more power, what brings more influence? It is reputation. It is um, accolades and, and, you know, status and it is money. Right. The more money you have, the longer reputation you have with with everyone else close to the money printer, the more power you have. And so therefore, 
the whole thing comes down to ranking who has the most money, right? Who has the biggest, um, you know, who, who has the biggest number of numbers behind their name? Like that is the thing that attract more money, right? Money brings more money because we're in a political currency Ponzi scheme. And so that's what we all from the top down all implicitly desire, right? We all want a bigger house with more dollars, even if it doesn't change your lifestyle at all, right? Like your house, let's say if it's, you know, half a million dollars, it could go up and down a percent in value in any given month, make five or lose. You can make or <laughs> you can make or lose more money in any given month, any given month on the value of your house than your income, right? Like let's say your income is five grand a month. If your house is half a million. Your house goes up in value 1% because rates got cut or something. You've made more money in your house this month than your income, right? Or, or vice versa, you know, and it's, but it doesn't impact your life at all. It's the exact same house you're living in at the first of the month. It's the same house you're living in at the 31st of the month. So, um, you know, but still, nonetheless, we crave that number, right? So um, <laughs> I was having this conversation with, with um, someone recently about how, you know, they, they stacked an extra little bit of Bitcoin and, you know, it they were happy because they increased their stat stack. But at the same time, it's like, doesn't change my life at all. I'm never going to sell it. You know, he's doing it, I guess, for greater peace of mind. But why do people eventually stop stacking Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin number has gone up, price has gone up, and they are wealthy. They, they stop stacking because they've already achieved the peace of mind, right? Like when you are early to Bitcoin and you don't yet feel like you have, quote unquote, enough Bitcoin, um, it's because you don't feel like you have enough Bitcoin to be or, or, or have the stability yet. Um, you know, but once that's achieved, I see it all the time with my clients at, at Bitcoin Advisor. I, I see it all the time with people I help, uh, you know, because my job at Bitcoin Advisor is to help people stack more Bitcoin, right? My average client, I help them stack an extra 51.2% more Bitcoin in the first 12 months. And so it, obviously that that's an average. So some people stack only 10% more Bitcoin. Other people stack 300% more Bitcoin. And the funny thing is that, you know, as I work with clients, you know, some of them I build, you know, pretty good relationship with. And I see that mindset just totally shift. Like I walk them, we walk through it and over the course of a year, over the course of six months, like their mindset just totally shifts and they go from, oh my goodness, I don't have nearly enough. I need to accelerate my stacking to now, okay, their stack, stack has doubled. Um, you know, their stack, stack has doubled. They limited their expenses and like, you know, and more importantly, as importantly, they've secured their Bitcoin and proper self-custody and they look around and they're like, I've achieved that comfort. I don't need to, had that same urgency anymore that that the that, that, that asymmetric bet is no longer in my favor right you know doing all these sacrifices to stack is no longer required because i have enough i'm still going to stack i'm still going to stack a lot but it, it's a whole mental shift so anyway um yeah so yeah i think there's a lot there and i i think um you know i, I think it just comes down to that perception people have um yeah. Interesting. How do you, um, I mean, I guess it's a highly individual question to, to each individual, but how do you uh, get someone to, to, to stack more uh, without having like more income and stuff like that? What, what are some of the things that, that you can share about what, what mind shift shift you make with your uh, clients? Well, I, I think it comes back to power, right? So like I was saying before, Humans are attracted to power on a, on a central banking standard. The metric at which we value power is more money, right? And I guess the implication I made, although I probably should have said it more explicitly, the, the power in Bitcoin is the idea, right? Like, why do we respect Michael Saylor? Is it because he has money? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, most people think, oh, you Bitcoiners, you idolize or you love Michael Saylor because he's so freaking rich. It's like, no, actually it's not. Why? It's because he's got the ideas. Like Michael Saylor... You know, and I, I, he's already come up like five times. Everybody brought him up like five times. But I think it's very useful because he's a good oversimplification for this whole dynamic. You know, why does Michael Saylor have a unique position of power in Bitcoin's history? It's because he has the money. And as importantly, I would argue more importantly, he has the ideas, right? And so Michael Saylor has an advantage in the fiat central banking era because he has way more access to money than you and I do and cheap money. 
And in the Bitcoin era, he's still going to be one of the richest people in the world in all of Bitcoin, because unlike all the other billionaires that yet to come after him, they don't have the ideas, right? You know, billionaires coming after him, maybe they buy as much Bitcoin as he does. Maybe they buy more even. A couple of them probably will. But they were not here with the plebs in 2020, in 2021, in 2022, in 2023, in 2024, in 2025, right? They weren't here with the plebs. They weren't sharing ideas, right? And so I, 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 I yeah. So anyway, to summarize explicitly uh, to your earlier question, the power in the fiat central banking era is with money. How many political currency units do you own? How much private equity do you control? How much, um, you know, what, what's your multiple, right? It's all numbers, 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 right? Who gets the most political currency, no matter the means, that is the person with the most power in a system that requires increasing centralization. But in Bitcoin, the, the metric, I think, in that world is going to be ideas. Because how do you get more power in a Bitcoin world? How you get more power is not by who has the most Bitcoin currency units, the most electricity currency units, the most sats. The way you get more Bitcoin in a Bitcoin world is a better idea. Ideas are secondary in the fiat world. Ideas are central and pivotal in the Bitcoin world. And that was a lesson I had to learn uh, uh, over time because I remember when I first uh, quote unquote came out of the Bitcoin scene, um, you know, I thought no, nobody's going to listen to me. Who cares? Nobody cares. I'm a young 20 year old guy. Um, you know, I don't have any money. I don't have a big company have exited. I don't like, I don't have any metric. You know, I, I, I never finished college. I dropped out of college. Like who's going to listen to me? What do I have to show for it? And, and I realized that the thing people care about is ideas. And I, I mean, now in hindsight, it kind of seems obvious to me, but at the time I didn't, I didn't believe it. I didn't get it. Now I see that, okay, the Bitcoiners are different. The Bitcoiners only care about his ideas. Right. So, so anyway, I, I think that's the future in Bitcoin is that. That is how power shifts from right now. We idolize people with the most currency units to in the future in the Bitcoin world. We idolize people with the best ideas because literally that gets you more Bitcoin. If you have the better idea, you can make the better business. You get more Bitcoin. If you have the better idea, you, you can gain more, more audience members. You can gain more attention. You can, you know, if you have the best idea wins, Bitcoin's the best idea. And so the people on Bitcoin with the best ideas win atop the system that rewards the best ideas. Um, and so that, I guess, you know, more explicitly answers that last question, but at the same time, it's the same answer for this question too. How, how, so the Bitcoin advisor, we have 40 people on the team. I was the first American at the team. Uh, we've been doing this, you know, the team's been doing this since 2016. Um, how, how do we help people buy more Bitcoin? Well, it's all frankly ideas, right? It's like every year we have 40 people on the Bitcoin advisor team. And so every year that passes, we have 40 minds out there. They're out there working, thinking that are very active in Bitcoin self-custody, very active in the Bitcoin community, listening, learning, um, you know, basically it's like a hive mind. And so when people become a client of the Bitcoin advisor, they're basically getting all the access of that, right? Like, you know, what's going to, what's going to be the education for the average person, right? Is, is it, is it one person spending, you know, two hours a day, every day, their whole life learning about Bitcoin? Or is it going to be them paying for a service that gives them access to dozens of people, dozens of, in my opinion, the top people in Bitcoin that are all learning on their behalf and have a direct financial incentive to help them learn, right? So Bitcoin advisor, we have half a percent service fee. I, I'm just saying this to explain and answer your question. We have a half percent service fee. And what I, I, what I often joke to people is that if joining the Bitcoin advisor, we can help you stack at least half a percent more Bitcoin, it pays for yourself, right? What's cheaper than a product was cheaper than a cheap product. The thing is cheaper, the cheap product is a more expensive service that pays for itself. And then that's cheaper, right? Um, and so we're tech agnostic at the Bitcoin advisor. We don't care what technology you use. We don't care what platform you use, what modular multi-sig product we use, how you, you know, store your, you know, configuration files or, you know, hardware device, you know, we don't care about any of that. The incentive is not by how many hours do we book you for. It's not by what products can we show for you so we get an affiliate link? The, the the thing that we're incentivized with is how do we help you buy more Bitcoin? And so frankly, it just comes down to incentive. I, I have a direct incentive for my clients to help them stack more Bitcoin as fast as possible at the cheapest price possible. And so of course, with that being an incentive, it is inevitably going to result in us having the conversation that oftentimes is them just having new ideas they didn't think of otherwise, right? So, you know, I have seen people, um, and this is just in general, right? Both as a result of being a client of mine and just in general, right? 
people that have money in their Roth IRA, they don't realize they can roll over to Bitcoin. Maybe they got bonds or some mutual fund in there and they just haven't had the idea to roll the money over in there. And so them having the knowledge to do that and then being able to see to do that, to take self-custody within the Roth IRA, within their super fund, that is a big value add to them. For other people, in particular Americans, they don't realize that there are these things called revocable and irrevocable trusts. They never thought about that before. They're already stacking Bitcoin for their kids. And so this is a good tool for them to have. It's a good idea for them to explore. But unfortunately, the problem is that they don't realize that the United States of America is cutting off the irrevocable trust significantly at the end of 2024. We've got um, less than three months now left until America reduces uh, the the cutoff or, or the you know, full benefits of irrevocable trust from 13 million down to 5 million, right? And most people will say, oh, that doesn't matter because I don't have $5 million, $13 million, but it doesn't matter because Bitcoin's going to be worth that at some point, right? And that's $7 million difference, being able to have an extra $7 million of, of, of wealth that you're going to be able to legally avoid death taxes, legally avoid capital gains. It's like, that is a huge benefit, right? And we are incentivized to discuss those ideas with clients because as a function of helping them save, you know, 30% on their tax bill 20 years from now, that is helping them stack more Bitcoin, right? Effectively, um, you know, so whether it's, it's finding ways to protect the Bitcoin, like minimize taxes, minimize the risk of key loss, inherit its planning, all that stuff. But really the fun part is helping people buy more Bitcoin. So one way of seeing people do it is just getting peace of mind. That is the biggest way at which people stack more Bitcoin, right? You know, maybe the husband is wanting to buy more Bitcoin. The wife is uncomfortable. You know, the husband is wanting to refinance the house, take out 20% of the equity in the house and smash by Bitcoin because they can get a 6% interest rate or whatever. It's something that's really good, right? But the wife, the family, whomever doesn't want to do that. Well, by sitting down with them and talking with the family, you know, we can uncover things that may not have been realized before, right? You know, the, the husband may think, oh, you know, the wife doesn't want me to buy more Bitcoin because she doesn't believe in Bitcoin. She just doesn't understand it. I'm going to send her another Michael Saylor podcast. We sit down, we talk and we realize, oh, she's actually not concerned about Bitcoin. She's concerned you're going to lose the Bitcoin. She's not concerned that Bitcoin price is volatile. She actually kind of gets it or she wants to understand it more. Okay. And here's some resources we can have to help her. What we begin to uncover in that conversation was you realize, oh, her big concern was that if something happens to you, she doesn't know anything without a handle the Bitcoin. Well, let's set up this security solution. Let's set up some inheritance plan. Let's walk everyone in the family through how this works. Let's bring that peace of mind. Let's bring that comfort. And now we have the implicit ability to double our DCA, which then doubles the ability to step. Or maybe we have the implicit, you know, or, or explicit, you know, authority to sell the extra car we don't need to buy more Bitcoin, to refinance some other kind of high interest debt for lower interest rate debt, to borrow money to buy Bitcoin, right? And so people of different ways, I've seen people take up multi-million dollar loans at 0% interest for 10 years via some government loan, um, you know, and use a portion of that, if not the majority of that to buy Bitcoin. I've seen people um, decide, you know, I'm dollar cost averaging $1,000 a month to Bitcoin. Why, instead of dollar cost averaging 1,000 months to Bitcoin over the next 100 months, why don't I just borrow a hundred grand lump sum today? Cause historically lump sum outperforms DCA. And then I use that cash flow. I was going to use to buy Bitcoin anyway, to then use to pay off the debt. Right. And so of course, every option has its own risks, you know, borrowing, not borrowing, doing this, doing that, having it within a taxable account, having it without a taxable account, having it within a revocable trust outside of a revocable trust, all these things have trade-offs and options. But like I was saying before, power in Bitcoin, is different than power in the fiat system. Power in the fiat system is who has the most political currency. It's power in Bitcoin is who has the most ideas and the most ideas for optionality. And so all we do at the Bitcoin Advisor is we give people optionality and say, hey, here are the 30 ideas you have right now of how to stack more Bitcoin. Here's an additional 20 ideas. We'll work on another 10 ideas. We'll probably have new ideas every year. And here are all the ideas. Which of these do you want to do? And if once you decide which of these you want to do, we can help make sure you're going to do it in the safest way possible to minimize your tax bill, stack as many Bitcoins as you can. Uh, you know, and frankly, the history, you know, the track record proves itself, frankly. Um, you know, some some of my clients, you know, we stack a little bit more, like an extra five, ten percent. Other people, most people would probably stack, you know, 30, 40 percent, just anecdotally. That's my experience. But the average technically is 51.2 percent, because some people just go out there and really achieve because they had a small business. They never thought about having a small business stack Bitcoin. Uh, maybe they have a church 
and their pastor or their elders at the church are trying to understand Bitcoin, but haven't got their head around it. And it's just too much work. Well, hey, if we can set up a multi-sig where, you know, the elders of the church can each hold a key. Well, now we can remove that concern of a single point of failure. And now the church can start buying or the small business can start buying or, or you know, the other members of the family. Right. And for me, that's the most fun part at work is when people join the service because they're trying to help themselves. But then they realize after, you know, some pretty quick realize that, oh, this is the way to get my uncle to buy more Bitcoin. This is the way to get my parents to buy more Bitcoin, right? It's like, yeah, I'm buying Bitcoin myself, but if I help my parents buy more Bitcoin and I help them do it in a, a, a multi-sig solution that's jurisdictionally arbitrage, that has an inheritance plan, that Bitcoin's eventually get, going to get back to me, right? And that's in my own self-interest. It's in my interest to help my parents understand Bitcoin and plug them in in this you know, multi-sig solution where they cannot lose their Bitcoin and nobody has ever lost their Bitcoin in this solution, right? That's in my incentive because I want more Bitcoin. And the fastest way for me to get more Bitcoin is no longer just to use my own income, but to leverage the incomes of the, my loved ones around me. It's in my own self-interest, right? But at the same time, it's in their self-interest because of course you want to help your dad. Of course you want to help your kid. Of course you want to help your church, your business, your boss, your, your employees, whomever. Of course you want to help them buy more Bitcoin because it's in their best interest. And so anyway, um, there's lots of different ways for this to happen. You know, some people are more complicated than others. Some people, um, it's just as simple as them not realizing they can take self custody within their super fund, within their, uh, IRA, inherited IRA, traditional, IRA, you know, Roth, whatever, like some people just don't realize that, uh, you know, I've got some people that, uh, you know, just haven't thought about, oh, wait, you know, I've got, I, I don't have a Roth IRA. My wife doesn't have a Roth IRA. I've got three kids, you know, that are all you know, let's say 18 to 21. Well, shoot, I could contribute seven grand. She can contribute seven grand. Each of them, we could gift them seven grand. They can each contribute. On, I mean, the Bitcoin's going to them anyway when I die, right? So all of a sudden, that's one, two, three, four, five, five times seven. Um, you know, what's five times seven? 35? That's 35 grand of Bitcoin. I can buy, you know, this taxable year. And then that's 35 grand I could buy on the first of next year, just a smash buy. All of a sudden, I've got one whole Bitcoin that's in full self-custody with no upside uh, of you know, with, with no with no capital gains for all the upside right i can get one bitcoin maybe i've got all these other bitcoin elsewhere so anyway I, I, my, my rambling point is that there's a bunch of different ways to do that and you know there's not a one size fits all solution so i don't really feel comfortable saying a one size fits all solution but probably the best summarization of it is just ideas time and talking to people getting to know people what is your goal is your goal to retire in eight years is your goal to pass it on for your kids is your goal this is your goal that well based on what you want based on what your goal is and based on my personal experience and based on the experience of these other you know 39 people at the bitcoin advisor and our experience working with many many clients over the years um you know especially you know our partners peter and andy um you know basically how can we help you have the ability to stack as much as you can while minimizing downside loss and maximizing um, upside as soon as possible, right? Because that's the other thing too, is that um, if we can if we can accelerate someone's education by three years, that's a that's a big deal, right? Because Bitcoin price three years from now is probably going to be a lot higher. I wish I had that because um, I certainly did it. And, you know, I learned a lot of lessons, both to the upside and the downside. You know, um, I, I, I guess to conclude this little answer here is a metaphor. Um, you know, I, I think the metaphor is like comparing somebody that teaches guns or somebody that teaches cars, right? Most people are out there and they ask me, Luke, what's the best hover ball? Luke, what's the best product? What's the best this? What's the best that? I'm, I'm confused. I'm, I'm, I'm scared. There's so many options, blah, blah, blah. It's like, what you don't need, you don't need another product, right? You don't need to, you don't need to hear about the new latest car model, right? There's a thousand car models out there. Every single one's different. Every single one has its nuances. Like, and I don't know what the answer is for you because I don't know what your priorities are. What you don't, you don't need another car model what you need is a driving instructor. <laughs> like the first time you're going to drive a car, probably the first 10 times you're going to drive a car, you need a driving instructor. that's going to come alongside you and teach you about all the different kinds of cars, right? Or likewise with guns, you know, you want to go to a gun range with, you know, 30 different guns laid out in front of you and ask somebody, Hey, what's your favorite kind of gun? When, you know, you have all these different people, each incentivized by their own product, like, okay, this person gets a 5% kickback from selling that gun, that person gets a 10% affiliate link from selling that gun. Not there's anything wrong with that, right? You know, I, I've done that before. And, you know, if you believe in the product, like it's good to sell the product, but probably the most efficient thing to help the person understand Bitcoin more efficiently, faster, at most importantly, a cheaper Bitcoin price 
is to be a trainer alongside them and educate them on all the products and help them do that. So anyway, that was a very long answer, but the long answer short is that in the fiat world, power is who has the most currency. In the Bitcoin world, power is who has the best ideas. And frankly, people are willing to pay for the network of people that have really good ideas. And so that's what that's what I try to do. That's what we try to do is we try to have the best ideas to be perpetually 18 to 24 months ahead of everyone else. I love that a lot. And uh, time is really valuable in, in Bitcoin. Right. Uh, the sooner you understand what you're doing, uh, the sooner the, the better. It's like the first time stepping into Bitcoin. Uh, when you do that, that's already valuable if that's like one year or two years ahead of that. But then also within Bitcoin, um, just like having the knowledge of like year three already in year one, that's like a major advantage and it's probably uh, the best financial decision you can ever take to, to get that ideas and those knowledge is already like in year one and not in year three or year four. That's that's really, really cool. I love that. I had so many uh, different topics already planned out, but we probably make like in half a year or a year a, a second round just for that um, because we're already over one hour and we have an end routine. Um, one question that I really would like to, to give to you is also um, that we give to every guest of, of our show. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Is that I hope people can learn not just how to get rich in Bitcoin or how early they are in Bitcoin, and that is important, right? I think we're very early to Bitcoin. I talk about how early we are to Bitcoin, not as a means of hopium, but as a bit of, you know, a bit of legitimate, respectable fear, right? It's like, again, you have less in common with near future than the ancient past. You have more in common with Michael Saylor. If you are a sat billionaire, or even in the discussion of being close to a sat billionaire, you have more in common with Michael Saylor and the average person in the future, right? You're going to be a target. You're going to be a target for scammers coming after you, for people using AI bots to come after you and your family, for phishing attacks, SIM card swaps, people trying to get your seed phrase, right? Exploiting everything they can cryptographically. They're going to exploit everything they can with the tax man. They're going to exploit everything they can with lawfare, right? I think it's a big one. I've not mentioned it this show, and I've mentioned it a few other times, but I think that's a big one people in Bitcoin are forgetting. Is like all the fiat parasites, where they're going to become unemployed, uh, you know, <laughs> they're going to have a new target and that's going to be OG Bitcoiners, right? They're going to come after everyone in Bitcoin that was before 2030 or 2035 and say, this person's got a good amount of Bitcoin. Let's sue them because they offended me online or whatever, right? Or they gave bad financial advice, quote unquote, online or whatever, right? And it's like, if I can't get them cryptographically, maybe I could leverage the courts against them and make their life, you know, really, really uncomfortable, you know? And so all I have to say is that um, I hope people learn it's not just about bitcoin number go up hopium you just want to see bitcoin go to 50 million dollars but it's that if bitcoin's going to go to 50 million dollars and you've got half of bitcoin are you ready for 25 million dollars net worth i mean frankly most people aren't um i i firmly believe at least 90 percent of people in bitcoin right now are going to lose at least a third of the bitcoin because i have seen people lose bitcoin in so many different ways ways that um are just very difficult to describe. Um, even people that have had experience, right? Um, whether that's from the courts or that's from losing keys or that's from you know people stealing it or whatever. Um, any single point of failure is perpetually larger honeypot as Bitcoin goes up. Every time Bitcoin price doubles, the the target of any single point of failure you have is, is triple the target, right? Um, associated with that goes up, right? Every time Bitcoin price doubles, your stress associated with with it goes out. So I, I, I hope people learn that or hear that from me is that, yes, I'm bullish in Bitcoin. Yes, we less come through from the past, but that is everything's a trade off. Um, yes, the benefit is that's going to be rich. That's, that's going to make you rich. That's the benefit. The downside is that you're going to be rich. And, you know, Michael Saylor has problems that the average poor person can't relate to. Right. And likewise, you know, you're going to have problems being a sat billionaire that we can't really relate to right now problems and threats we haven't even begun to think about yet because the technology doesn't yet exist. Um, and then beyond that, I hope beyond number go up, keeping the wealth like I've been describing and like I would highly encourage people to check out the Bitcoin advisor. The most important thing of all is how to steward that, right? Like it doesn't matter if you save a Bitcoin for each of your kids and your kids grow up to be immoral, degenerate, you know, people. It's like they're going to squander the wealth. The wealth will be gone. And what was it for? 
your descendants have no money, they have no morals, they have nothing to stand on. Like, what was it all for, right? So, you know, I, I, I highly encourage people to accelerate their Bitcoin education to peace of mind as quick as possible, because what I really want, I don't really want people to buy more Bitcoin and everyone get rich in Bitcoin. I want people to buy their time back because I firmly believe people are about to have a lot more free time on their hands in the next few decades, more than anything else in human history. And so I think the question is, how are we going to steward that power? Are we going to steward that power with entertainment and, and distractions and have people go their whole lives? Um, have done have having done nothing of substance and nothing of temporal or eternal value um, or are people going to have that time back because they've been freed from the parasitic time suck of zero sum wealth inequality and fiat currency and they're going to take that time and they're going to be able to magnify works and virtues in their life so i guess that's my hope for people is that I think we should be wildly bullish on Bitcoin price. I think we should be wildly bullish on Bitcoin scams, lawfare, and attacks coming after OG Bitcoiners, which is everybody watching this. Uh, and I say bullish, you know, meaning that I guess you're bearish. I don't know if that's bullish or bearish, right? Bearish on people. I, I guess I'm bullish on people losing more Bitcoin, bullish on the scams, <laughs> which is, I, I guess, a bearish emotional sentiment. But anyway, um, but then, of course, most importantly, I think, it's the big question right now. If the question is what is money, the next question we're all going to face is what do we do now in the face that we know money, right? Now that, now that you're rich, now that you're retired, now that you have more money than you can imagine, right? If you have half a Bitcoin, you're going to have more money than you can imagine in 20, 30 years. It's like, okay, now what, now what do you do? I mean, I think that's the big question. I think some people are going to squander that. Maybe even most people will squander that, but my hope is to get as many people as possible to, not frankly throw their life away and to do something that is of temporal and eternal significance for themselves and for their loved ones so anyway hopefully we all can move the needle a little bit in that direction i guess with, with great power comes great responsibility <laughs> yeah for sure uh, for sure uh, and and it, it is at times i'm very optimistic at times you're very pessimistic right you know a lot of bitcoiners understand that power Frankly, most of them don't, because if they understood the power, they wouldn't have Bitcoin on exchanges. Yet they do. Um, you know, like if you have your Bitcoin on exchanges, you don't understand Bitcoin. Like, like you you are actively being a hypocrite to yourself. Like, like this isn't some trivial issue. Like, you fundamentally don't understand what you have here or the risk you're in, right? If you got Bitcoin on exchanges, it is going to be taken from you, right? The majority is going to rebel and and vote the government into power to seize your Bitcoin. Or you have your exchange app on your phone. Somebody's going to swipe your phone over lunch and, and withdraw your Bitcoin for you because they took it more seriously than you did. Or you're going to get some other attack or, or the exchange will go down, you know, whatever. And so, yeah, with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I, I wish more people in the fiat world would take that warning and adopt Bitcoin, but 99% of them won't. I wish people in Bitcoin would take their Bitcoin self-custody seriously and Frankly, 90% of them, I don't think are to the degree they probably should. And probably 90% of the people that even are taking that seriously, you know, are they taking everything else in life super seriously? I don't know, including fun, right? Life is fun. Life is an adventure. And uh, we can't change the outcome. All we can do is um, do the best of our ability. And so hopefully, um, I guess, hopefully this is inspiration for people to aim higher aim higher with their stacking goal, aim higher with stacking more Bitcoin and aim higher at increasing their life and increasing the lives of those they care about. I love that a lot. Really, really cool. We have entered it in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the, for the next guest. And your question from the previous guest is, what is the biggest bear case uh, for, for Bitcoin? Actually, that's very related. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the biggest bear case is that something bad happens to the world, right? Um, you know, if the hope with, you know, with Bitcoin, again, we talked about wealth inequality a lot, or, or at least I rambled about it a lot. Uh, you know, so the ultimate bull case for Bitcoin is that the world gets richer. The ultimate bear case for Bitcoin is that the world gets poor, right? You have no need for a smartphone in ancient Rome, right? Because you literally can't use it. There's no point, right? There, there are technological systems, paradigms that just cannot overlap with each other. You can't have the electricity, internet, 
um, microchip age at the same time as as you know the, the the time with goat herders and emperors and gladiators in the Colosseum. It's just like technologically they can't overlap. And so the big bear case for Bitcoin is that human society degrades to for whatever for whatever reason to whatever extent, um, and it ceases to have the need for Bitcoin. Because yes, it is true. Not everybody in the world right now needs Bitcoin. There are millions, if not a billion people that need other things more than Bitcoin. Right now. You know, we'd like to say <clears throat> Bitcoin is for everyone and it is for everyone in the right time. But right now, you know, like people are starving. They don't have a need for Bitcoin, right? Like they, they're, they got to worry about next week first before Bitcoin, right? And we can say, oh, that's short time preference, whatever. It's like, no, in that case, short time preference is what matters because they're dealing with a short time preference problem. They don't have a problem over the next 30 years of fiat debasement. They have a problem of their children are going to starve in the next two weeks if they don't get more money, right? So uh, so that is the biggest threat to Bitcoin is, is that the world degrades and we no longer have long time preference problems. Bitcoin is a long time preference solution. But if for whatever reason we had some sort of global war or an asteroid was going to destroy the earth or whatever, obviously those would be the biggest threats. Uh, I think to Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself, I don't see any risk. Um, you know, quantum computers is something a lot of Bitcoiners get wrong. Um, and it's something a lot of people, I, I, it's shocking to me, but unfortunately most people get this wrong, but with quantum computers, you know, technically, technically it could be a threat if it accelerated fast enough. I mean, really it's not. Why is it not? Because Bitcoin's going to upgrade, right? Bitcoin's going to upgrade. Everything's going to be quantum proof. It's all going to be fine. Right. And obviously many more things would be at risk, like, you know, nuclear launch codes, if quantum computers were around, right? But what people forget is that, like, it's a matter of time until the lost Bitcoin get found by quantum computers, right? If we upgrade Bitcoin to be quantum resistant in the future and and keys, um, you know, especially a lot of the older keys, uh, you know, like if you lost your coins and you don't and you don't any longer control the Bitcoin, then obviously once Bitcoin upgrades to quantum, everyone upgrades to quantum, or, you know, large governments have quantum computers or whatever, like they're going to be found, right? Like Satoshi's coins are probably going to be found. Other lost coins are probably going to be found, right? Because if you lost the keys, you inherently can't move those Bitcoin to a quantum resistant place in, you know, the, the cyber universe. And so eventually they're going to be found, right? And so you know, I, I say that as a smaller, and there's a lot more nuance there I'm glossing over, but that is a smaller portion on the larger umbrella that there are just so many threats in the future that we can't know. And so maybe there's a threat to Bitcoin we can find. Um, but I don't think it's quantum. I don't think, I, I don't think there's any real threat I can see. I mean, that's really the only big internal threat I can see that is, you know, somebody in the future with quantum computers discovers a million lost Bitcoin, they dump it onto the market and that crashes price. But I mean, you know, they may not even dump it, right? Cause they have an expense. They need to hold the Bitcoin, right? So they may not even, that they may even be a non-trivial concern, but even the worst case, that's just a small concern. Um, you know, so there's minor quote unquote threats internally, but I think the only real threat is externally that the world degrades to a certain point where um, we don't have a need for um, Bitcoin anymore because we don't have 10 year problems. We have 10 month problems. Um, but the optimism and all that is that, you know, in 2022, we had our first first tests of, of changing the trajectory of an asteroid so you know we literally know how to change the trajectory of an asteroid uh, but we don't yet know how we could kill bitcoin even with futuristic technology like quantum computers or future future weapons of war right even if we developed a mega weapon more powerful than a nuclear bomb that doesn't kill bitcoin even if we had quantum computers theoretically the worst we could do is discover a couple million lost bitcoin dump the price for maybe a year you know, I mean, like we don't know, even with envisioning future technology, we don't yet know how to kill Bitcoin, kill ourselves. And so the biggest threat to Bitcoin is that we kill ourselves and we kill um, the rest of the world. So, but in that case, obviously we have bigger problems, more important problems than Bitcoin um, because Bitcoin is a tool to help people. And so if there are no more people, the tool is worthless. So um like there, that, that's also that like four different tangents yeah. in there that, you know that we could go on about but i i, I won't because i know i've talked enough <laughs> <laughs> no it was really really cool i loved it and i think i guess it also comes down and uh, that that's what also i, I always is my um takeaway from the bear cases of bitcoin 
in all the really realistic bear cases is like, yeah, um, we don't need Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, you know, right. Exactly. Then, like, if, if, yeah. if electricity is is gone or something like that, like, then we have bigger problems than yeah, yeah, money. Like, we we need a, a maybe a gun or something like that in our house. But yeah, really cool. Um, I love the podcast with you. It was really really cool. Um, when people now want to check you out, ask you questions, reach out to you, maybe see the Bitcoin advisor. Where can they find you? Where can they ask you questions? Uh, well, they can find me on Twitter, otherwise known as X, Luke Broyles, L U K E B R O Y L E S. Please be careful of the scammers. The scammers are everywhere. They will come after you. They will ask you for money. Uh, so yeah, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on YouTube with the same name, Luke Broyles, B-R-O-Y-L-E-S. Um, you can find me at the Bitcoin Advisor. I was first American Bitcoin Advisor. Robin, you'll probably put my info in the description. Um, but yeah, just reach out. Uh, just you know, introduce yourself. Say what you're looking for. If you want Bitcoin in retirement accounts, uh, we can do that. Self-custody for you. If you want to have multi-jurisdictional vaults, where you have keys in multiple countries, we can do that for you. If you want to help your small business, your large business, your church, your family, I understand Bitcoin, we can help you do that. And if you just want to buy as much Bitcoin as quickly as possible, if it, especially, please, especially if you're considering borrowing money to buy more Bitcoin, like, please just reach out because I get it. I know you want to do it, but let's just talk about it because the, the worst things I've seen personally are when people borrow money to buy Bitcoin, then they lose the underlying asset, the Bitcoin, and now they're left with a lot of debt. And, you know, so again, like, you know, anyway, for whatever reason, yeah, people can find me there. And um, also my website, uh, LukeBTC.com. You can find me at LukeBTC.com. Um, pretty simple website domain. So you can find me there. Um, but yeah, those would be the places. Bitcoin Advisor, uh, LukeBTC.com, uh, on Twitter, on YouTube. And of course, I, I run a couple awesome other Bitcoin podcasts. I run uh, Blockware's podcast and I run Bitcoin is Better. So if you want, you can find me at Blockware. We do hosted mining. Uh, great, great company, great product for people, especially for people that are looking to mine, but don't want the hassle of it. And uh, Bitcoin is Better is a great 501c3 nonprofit organization I'm volunteering for where we help Bitcoin newbies um, understand it. The goal is to orange pill a thousand people in the next three years. I think we're going to make it. So anyway, that was a lot of places, but YouTube, Twitter, website, LukePTC.com, Bitcoin Advisor, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'll do my best to, to help you any way I can. Thank you, Robin. Really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, also, like the link uh, will be in the description uh, in YouTube, wherever you, you're watching. And also, thank you so much uh, for your time, Luke. Thank you so much for also uh, everyone watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow for another episode. Bye-bye.